Hello and welcome virtually to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. My name is Christopher Sands and I'm director of the Canada Institute here at the Wilson Center. 50 years ago, the United States Congress created the Wilson Center uh, to, in their words, strengthen the fruitful relation between the world of learning and the world of public affairs. Today, we're doing just that. As part of Wilson's Hindsight Upfront Initiative, examining the lessons of the war in Afghanistan in real time. In particular, in this episode, we'll be talking about the lessons that Canada, an ally in that war, learned uh, or took from the experience. And we have two outstanding experts who will uh, walk us through that, very much part of their active research. Janice Stein is the Bellsberg Professor of Conflict Management in the Department of Political Science and was the founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and a member of the Order of Canada and the Order of Ontario, very distinguished. Eugene Lang is on the faculty of Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. He began his career in the federal government and served in both the public service and in minister's offices. He was policy advisor to the Solicitor General of Canada, a senior policy advisor to the Deputy Prime Minister of Canada for Economic Affairs, senior economist at, the, at Finance Canada, and chief of staff uh, to the Secretary of State for Finance and to two ministers of national defense. Stein and Lang are co-authors of The Unexpected War, Canada in Kandahar, a 2007 book that became a national bestseller won the Writers' Trust Cohen Award for political writing and was shortlisted for the Donner Prize for the best book on Canadian public policy. And it was even more importantly named one of the 100 best books uh, of the year in 2007 by the Globe and Mail. So they, they know this subject well and they have studied uh, deeply the war in Afghanistan. The book, uh, th those of you who uh, haven't read it, you will find is, is rich in anecdotes because of their ability to interview practitioners um, on the lessons that they were learning in real time, very much what this series is all about. So let me begin uh, with you, Janice. Tell us a little bit about the war in Afghanistan from a Canadian perspective. Why did Canada join the United States in those fateful days after September 11? And why Afghanistan and famously not so much Iraq? These were uh, very, very different times, Chris. It was 20 years ago, but it feels like uh, a century ago, frankly. Uh, and there was the, the Soviet Union was no longer uh, the United States stood astride the world. Uh, and there was, to be honest, I think, looking back, um, a sense of hubris uh, about what outsiders could do when they deployed their military forces beyond the battlefield. Now, this, of course, as everybody knows, this decision came up in the wake of 9-11, which was for the United States, a trauma, and for Canadians as well, because this was the first attack on North America that came really uh, from beyond its borders since the British, <laughs> uh, if we want to go back that far. And Canadians really stood in solidarity with the United States. Uh, and after the overthrow of the Taliban by the United States, which for the record, was a lean expeditionary force, which relied on local leaders, especially in the North, um, local tribal leaders uh, to do most of, the, um, most of the fighting. But beyond that, we saw something in 2000, the reason I was pausing for a moment over this, we saw something in 2001 uh, that we saw again tribal leaders saw the handwriting on the wall and in many cases negotiated agreements um, for peaceful fall, in other words. They handed over control without intensive fighting in much of Afghanistan. And Afghani tribal leaders have always been able um, to engage in very sophisticated political negotiation amongst themselves. But that was something that eluded Westerners. Uh, there was, and, and Jean has absolutely wonderful stories, which I, Jean, if you tell one, it was about the state of knowledge 
um, in Foreign Affairs Canada and the Canadian military about Afghanistan. No Dari or Pashtun speakers. And one of my favorite anecdotes uh, that Jean tells is going with then Minister of National Defense, um, John McCallum to London and getting briefed by a journalist. That was the best source of intelligence that we had. So what we did, we did um, as part of a larger US led coalition. This decision, as many foreign policy decisions, was all about us and not very much about Afghanistan. Um, Professor Lang, do you, she just told two of your anecdotes, but uh, do, can you add some color? How did this look in Canada when it was first proposed to go to Afghanistan? Those were heady days and you were at the center of them, uh, as I recall. Well, I think it was partly thought of as we don't really have a choice. Um, Article 5 had been invoked of the NATO treaty for the first time in the history of the of the treaty. Um, you know, I, I remember working in Ottawa on 9-11, and it was a blow to people in Ottawa, people in Canada. I can remember going into a meeting, you know, half an hour after the towers were hit, and my boss had gathered everybody around the room and said, and I, I'll never forget this because he was absolutely right, things will never be the same again. And he made that point 30 minutes after the first plane hit the tower, one of the towers of the World Trade Center. So, you know, the, the, the mood in the government of Canada, and I actually think it probably transcended well into the population was, we've never seen anything like this. Uh, New York City is not very far from Ottawa. The weather on 9-11 in New York City was exactly the same as it was in Ottawa. I can remember it. Crystal clear day. 26, 27 degrees Celsius. So there's a real affinity. There's a geographic, a cultural and alliance affinity. And, and I think the feeling was we have to be part of this. And then the question is, well, what are we going to do? What should we do? What is it gonna look like uh, when the Americans go in there? And that's what the struggle of the next decade was in the federal government in Ottawa, trying to figure out how does Canada fit in into this coalition in Afghanistan? What can we usefully do uh, both to support the NATO alliance, our closest ally, the United States, and to have some meaningful impact, hopefully, in Afghanistan and in the region. Let, let me pick up on that uh, that theme and come back to you, Janice. That one of the things that was different between Iraq and Afghanistan was the structure of the involvement, both with United Nations and also with, with a NATO uh, endorsement. Did that make it easier for Canada, as compared to Iraq, to choose Afghanistan as its theater? Oh yeah, and I think she would agree with me. There's no question that because, first of all, it's Article Five uh, was invoked for the for, for the first time in its history, and there was an obligation by NATO member to come to the defense of other NATO members when they're attacked. Now, who was that? Here? The leader of the alliance, our next door neighbor, uh, to whom we have all these affinities. So I think that alone. Chris would have dictated that, of course, we were going to be engaged. So the terms of the debate were all about how. In Iraq, the story was exactly the reverse. You know, our prime minister at the time, Prime Minister Craig, said over and over and over again, um, we will do this if it is sanctioned by the UN Security Council. And invoke language that is familiar to Canadians, middle power rules-based international order. Gina and I were just talking about that. That was just baked into the DNA. And, you know, sometimes uh, um, I will say, honestly, I believe that it's best uh, before date has passed, but it's a hard conversation to have in this country. And it was just, in, from that perspective, reflexive that if there was no uh, Security Council authorization and no NATO demand uh, in Iraq, which there were neither were present, then Canada was not going to go. Do you have time for another anecdote, though, on of Iraq? Of course. <laughs> well, Jean will laugh here, um, but many, many years later, um, I happened to be at a dinner for the then Prime Minister, and I said to him, and it was late, and we had all uh, had the requisite amount of liquid refreshment as well as food to eat. And I said to him, Prime Minister, 
Um, there's so many stories about why he did not go into Iraq and why our intelligence um, was different. And he told me the following story. He said, he said with the greatest local color because he is one of the most colorful and dramatic prime ministers we've ever had. And Gina's smiling. And he said, you know, my staff thought I never read. They thought I never read anything, but that wasn't true. He said, so I took home those, Gene's already smiling, I took home those intelligence reports and I sat down in my easy chair and put my feet up. And the first thing I did when I opened the file, I saw pictures of weapons on trucks. And I said to myself, those are phony. <laughs> There's no way that any government that was planning to use those or had those assets would ever um, surface those things and put them on trucks where spy satellites could take pictures. He said, this intelligence is not worth a damn. He said, that made up my mind. I wasn't going into Iraq. <laughs> Fascinating. Uh, it is. <laughs> <laughs> much smarter than we all thought he was right <laughs> yeah he he was quite a sly fox as a politician but also as a statesman um right. gene when when canada first went to afghanistan i recall it was a little bumpy and early on there was a, a famous tragic friendly fire incident with some of the troops that arrived and they went through a period where they had to switch over gear because many of them had been redeployed from Europe, so they wore more the green rather than the desert uh, khaki. Can you describe that early phase of the uh, of, of the deployment of Canadians into Afghanistan and and how and why it was the way it was? Well, there was definitely some bumps in the road that, frankly, I think the media tended to exaggerate a little bit. But you know, it was a significant uh, ground deployment for Canada. Uh, the first wave in, we, we did send in a battle group. Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, 800 soldiers into Kandahar. Uh, but that was, by the time our forces got to Kandahar around February of 02, the Americans had more or less cleared the area and the insurgents, the Taliban, the Al-Qaeda, however you want to describe them, and more or less either retreated across the border or blended into the into the local community. And there wasn't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of uh, fighting going on when Canada got there. The only four fatalities that we took were in that friendly fire incident you're referring to in April of that year. But there were some bumps in the road around, you know, do we have the right equipment? Do we have the right training? Uh, do we have the, cap the capacity in, in the force for that size of a deployment? I think the history shows that we did have, for at least the first mission, all of that was, was in place. Um, but what wasn't assumed, and this I think is one of the great lessons for Canada, and other countries that should come out of it was the assumptions all along and all of the various decisions for Canada's deployments in Afghanistan were based on short term operations, a year, two years, six months. Nobody was thinking that, and I can tell you this, nobody was thinking that 10, 15, 20 years, it was all in these short term and even the operations were financed on short term, on a short term basis. So going forward, I think one of the great lessons in something like this is if you deploy your military into a failed state, which is what Afghanistan was at that time and arguably is again today, and you are making a meaningful contribution to a coalition operation. Now, there's lots of examples where Canada has made what I would call trivial or symbolic contributions, but this one was meaningful, especially from 2003 on. If you're making a meaningful contribution, you better be prepared to be in there for the long haul because you're you're going to be valued and it's going to be difficult to get out because you're making a meaningful contribution because because you're prepared to sacrifice treasure blood and so on and this is what canada found uh, and it's also the case that you don't make the assumption that that if it's a nato mission nato is going to help you rotate out this was another assumption that we built in it was in fact it was part of our strategy in 2003 when we went into kabul with a 2,200 person force, that NATO was going to help find our replacement. Well, that was a naive assumption because you become irreplaceable if you're taking, if you're doing the heavy lifting. And Canada did a lot of heavy lifting. You probably know that during those years, Canada, along with the United States and Britain, I think were the only three countries that had no national caveats on the ground in Afghanistan. In other words, no, no one was tying the hands of what their forces could do on the ground in terms of rules of engagement. Many of the other 
coalition militaries that were on the ground had all kinds of caveats. And this was a great frustration. I remember having these discussions with uh, the late Secretary Rumsfeld. I was in a couple of meetings with him and he was very frustrated about this and actually commended Canada for making the decision to put our forces in harm's way and to not restrict what they could do in that sense. Yeah, let me just add quickly, Chris, and I Please. think Jean would agree that during this whole period, the frame, the envelope for Canadian forces was peacekeeping right. um, with a nation building piece added on, but it was a peacekeeping operation. Um, and that's, I think, another big lesson to take away from all this. You don't go in um, to a country that where you've just overthrown the government, frankly, and broken it apart. I put a, a, a label of peacekeeping on it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a deep, deep failure to understand that this conflict may have been suppressed for a short period of time, but that it was going to come back. And that was, this was fundamentally going to be a war fighting mission. And when that happened, and Jean was right there at the time, when that happened, there was shock and consternation. And not only at the political level among you, but among the public, because it was no preparation of the Canadian public for the fact that Canadian soldiers were going to fight. Now, interestingly, after the Chrétien period, there was Martin government, uh, and which was a minority. And then we had Stephen Harper come in. And when Stephen Harper came in, did he did a quick visit to Afghanistan. It was sort of a surprise, kept very under wraps, and then talked about changing Canada's posture, taking on Kandahar at a very different time. What explained that pivot? Uh, how do you think uh, the Harper government saw things differently or perhaps consistently with what had come before? You know, Jean, you want to go first on that one? Well, I'd say this just to make sure we have the history right here. The decision to go back into Kandahar was made by the Martin government. Now, the deployment didn't really reach its full maturity until the Harper government had come into office, literally about two weeks after the Martin government left office. Cool. That deployment started in the summer of 2005, where I went there at that time into Kandahar, and it reached its maturity in February of 2006, and that's when the transition to the Harper government happened. February 2006, and then suddenly there were casualties. Like literally almost overnight, we started this uh, level of casualties that we'd never seen in the previous five years, that can four and a half years that Canada had been in Afghanistan, we had suffered seven fatalities. In the month of February of 2006, I think we suffered 10 or 15. Yeah. And it continued through that spring, Medusa and so on, Operation Medusa. The Harper government embraced the embrace the commitment that had been made by the Martin government. I mean, they could have, I suppose, pivoted and could have said, could have blamed the previous government and could have committed to try and getting out in a year or two, which was the original plan anyway, but they didn't. And I give him, Harper, some credit for this. They doubled down and basically embraced a policy decision made by another government that they did sort of support when they were in opposition, but it wasn't their mission. And, um, and in fact, extended the mission two or three times in terms of its duration uh, until eventually in 2011, they started to transition out of that mission into a training mission up around Kabul and then eventually transition Canada out of Afghanistan uh, in terms of the military commitment in 2014. And I would just add to what Gene said, uh -huh. uh, and I think it's really interesting that uh, Harper, when he became prime minister, supported the mission. But when he went, and as he continued to be briefed, he came to the conclusion, this was an unwinnable yeah. war and an unsustainable mission. And he came to that conclusion by 2011, frankly, and, and then gradually drew down. So uh, I, when we look back, <laughs> that the, the United States, I think, took far longer to reach the conclusion that Stephen Harper reached. And, and in Kandahar, in that period, the sort of Martin, but especially during the Harper years, the fighting got quite rough at times. Yeah. The IED presence on the road from Kandahar up to, uh, to Bagram Air Base uh, was not safe. And I remember that there was some 
there was even an arrangement to pick up some helicopters uh, in the field, sort of a field acquisition from the Americans just to be able to sustain the mission. And, and at one point there was hope that maybe Germans or French might step up their commitment to support the Canadians, but the U.S. Marine Corps ended up being the backup for Canadians. As that war intensified, as, as it became more intense, what were Canadians thinking or Canadian leaders thinking about the mission and, and the mission's requirements? I'll start with you, Janice, but then, uh, well, and then Jean. Uh, you know, just a high level answer, and then I'll bump it over uh, to Gina. I think that's when Harper began to reevaluate. You know, he took a hard look in, in a paradoxical way. This is not the impression that most people have of Harper. Um, it wasn't, there wasn't an ideological envelope in which this was all wrapped up in to the same degree, right? It was support your ally, that, that was there for sure. But when it became obvious, and the kind of examples you just mentioned, Chris, mm -hmm. that fatalities were continuing, that the Taliban, especially in Gandhar, which is the heartland, the home of the Taliban, this is where the, the Taliban first rose to power and then swept through the rest of Afghanistan. And mission after mission, right, was bedeviled by the same set of obstacles. That, I think, was the determining factor for him in drawing down the mission. And it was a very courageous thing to do by a conservative prime minister whom you would have expected. Um, the, the public, by the way, um, and this was part, I think, of the calculations of some of the senior military leaders in Canada, which we don't talk about uh, enough. Uh, you know, the army has not been a visible part of Canadian popular culture in the same way that the U.S. military is in the United States. And with this deployment to Afghanistan, and particularly the period that Jean just talked about, when the casualties began to mount, there was a sea change in the way the Canadian public viewed its military. We got things like the highway of heroes. Um, we had not had that in, in modern Canada. And when a soldier would come back, um, there would be a, a funeral procession that would go over the highway of heroes and people would line the bridge uh, to honor and respect the soldiers. And, you know, civilian organizations stepped up to support children of soldiers who, whose lives had been lost. So for the Canadian military, this was the period of greatest prominence and greatest political support that it had enjoyed in modern history. I agree with that. I, mean, I, I think it's also, uh, just to put a kind of an end on that, it's sort of conventional wisdom in Canada, I think, among a lot of people that Canada's involvement in Afghanistan was deeply unpopular and the Canadian public can't tolerate casualties. Oh. I think that's wrong, actually. I think that's a, a misreading of it. It was definitely a very controversial mission as when the casualties started mounting. The media focused on this as they should. The opposition focused on it as they should. Um, it was very controversial uh, among elites, for sure. Um, but as Janice said, support for the military remained very strong throughout. And I would point out that even though I saw opinion polls at the time that suggested, depending on where you lived in Canada and how you voted, your support for this mission maybe wasn't as strong as you would like. There were four general elections during Canada's time in Afghanistan, 04, 06, 08, and 011. And I don't think this was ever a major issue in any of those campaigns. I don't ever remember anybody making a credible argument that any of those elections turned in any way, shape, or form on, ca on Canada's involvement in Afghanistan, which tells me the Canadian public's very, you know, I, I think Janice is hitting on it too. Harper was a realist, both in the international relations theorist sense of the term and in the conventional understanding of the word. And I think Canadians are kind of like that when it comes to these situations. And I think that that period, that decade or so, 12-year period demonstrated that. Let me bring up another transition because you're right, we, we went from liberal governments to conservative governments in Canada during this period, but the United States went from George W. Bush, who was president uh, on 9-11, to the Obama administration. And the Obama administration sustained the mission, but it was clear, I think the president was quite frank, that he didn't really want to be there, but that, uh, but that it was necessary. And he talked about pulling out. How did the change in U.S. leadership uh, affect 
Canada's confidence in the leadership of the war, uh, positively, negatively, or was it was it really largely the same? It was it was largely over by the time Harper had already made his strategic decision, Chris, by the time President Obama became president. But I think it's worth talking about for just a minute, um, because there's a third lesson that Gene and I might pull out that speaks to the more contemporary period, because what you saw in the United States was a consistent push and promise by senior military leaders that just more troops <laughs> would solve this problem. If we get only surge forces, if we only could increase the forces, then the, the, the fundamental problems that the United States military was facing in Afghanistan uh, would be manageable. And you know the whole controversy, of course, in the United States around that Obama surge. What was missing from that whole discussion was the larger political context uh, in which this conflict was embedded. The fact that this was in many ways two things. It was a civilian war. It was a civil war between factions in Afghanistan. Those that never go away, as we see. And of course, that the Taliban were being resupplied, sustained all the time over the border in, in Pakistan. I, I think fundamentally what I take away from this whole period, how important the political analysis is when we deploy our forces, that they are never solely military deployments. And that was missing, I think, Gene. We didn't have enough of that in Canada during those years, frankly. And certainly you didn't have enough of it during those critical years in Washington. Gene, what's your, what's your take on the change? Well, part of the struggle with the Bush administration, I mean, right after 9-11, it was hard to be critical of the Bush administration or any administration in Washington, um, but that changed pretty rapidly. And the Bush administration was deeply unpopular in Canada. Uh, it was deeply unpopular in parliament, except among the conservative opposition, um, deeply unpopular in the liberal government, I can tell you that for a fact, and pretty unpopular, I think the most unpopular presidency Canada had seen in decades, only recently superseded by Trump. Um, so the shift to Obama, and, and Obama was, of course, the most popular American president we've seen since Clinton, I guess, or maybe even more popular. So, you know, did that affect, it, it could have, in a sense, given Harper because Obama came in when Harper was prime minister, it could have given him cover and more ground, more, you know, room to maneuver, I think, if he wanted to extend Canada's operations in Afghanistan, even if maybe he wanted to participate in some kind of a troop surge along that, at that time, because Obama, in those early years, and I think throughout his entire presidency, he was very popular in Canada, he could do no wrong <laughs> among the elites in this country anyway. Um, so it had that kind of a, it, there, there was that kind of a, a, a much different view about Washington, I think, uh, as between those two administrations. And the Bush administration could be difficult to deal with. I had to deal with them from time to time. And some of the people in the administration could be difficult, but they were respectful of Canada, very respectful of Canada, by and large, um, and valued Canada. And so you have to give them, you know, even if you don't agree with their politics, you don't agree with them ideologically. There was a grudging respect, I think, within the government for people like Colin Powell, um, even Rumsfeld to a degree, who could be very difficult and prickly to deal with. But you know, you you know where you stood with Rumsfeld, <laughs> that's for sure. And and there, you know, you you you, you have to respect that. Uh, you know, just on that point, Chris, just before we move on, and she would agree with me that George Bush is very kindly remembered now by Canadians. Oh yeah, now he's all a state... in comparison to Donald Trump. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's incredible. You're absolutely right. Now he's, you know, he's a statesman. He's been completely rehabilitated. Yeah. Uh, sort of like Nixon was, I guess, just before he died in some ways, but uh, yeah. Canadians look back with nostalgia. Like nostalgia for, for the Bush administration. <laughs> and as difficult as they could be to deal with, I mean, I'm sure they were nothing compared to dealing with the Trump administration you know, in Ottawa. Well, I, I, this, this, this is not, I'm not trying to avoid the subject, but let me fast forward over Donald Trump, who of course talked about getting out of uh, Afghanistan, never quite pulled it off, to the most recent news, the, the Biden administration and the withdrawal from Kabul, which uh, did not go to plan. Uh, it, it was obviously shocking. Canada had been out of Afghanistan 
uh, in terms of a military presence since 2014. How did that, uh, how did that withdrawal, uh, how was it seen in Canada? What, 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 what were Canadians thinking? Chris, in Canada? it is difficult to overemphasize how dismayed Canadians were by what they saw. It was shambolic. Okay, is the only word I can say. And that's never encouraging to Canadians when we see the United States dysfunctional to that degree. Uh, but let me just shade what you said. Canadians were out, the Canadian forces were out, but interpreters, uh, fixers, uh, um, people who would help the Canadian forces were not out. And those relationships continued long after the Canadian forces withdrew. And so when this, there was a, and, and actually they read the handwriting on the wall and began to get organized 18 months before this and sort of push our government and particularly immigration and refugee Canada to get going and to evacuate those who would be at risk because they had helped the Canadian forces. Well, our government wasn't fast enough. Uh, and as it became clear to the Canadian public that people who had helped the Canadian forces were hiding in Kabul, were not evacuated in time, were not being supported, did not have enough money. We had uh, a, a group of military veterans that sprung to life uh, along with journalists for human rights who, who were so concerned about fixers who worked with Canadian journalists, front page news in Canada, and, and probably because there were journalists involved right who yeah. had fixers and they could write about that story and they've written about it and written about it and there's actually i think gene and i don't know what you were reading is but i sense anger um actually not only uh, not to our time of the united states but at our government that we have left people who put their lives at risk uh for us during that period and we did not honor the commitments that we made to them over and over. There was real dismay in the public. Um, Jean, I want you to pick that up, but I, I, I'm reminded that uh, during the withdrawal, uh, Canada's Minister of Defense was himself an Afghan veteran, um, Harjit Sajjan. Um, how, how was that viewed in Ottawa, in the Trudeau government? How was it viewed by Canadians, Jean? Well, I don't know exactly how it was viewed by the Trudeau government. I mean, I think anybody watching the news through that period saw it as a debacle. I mean, I mean let's call a spade a spade. I mean, it looked like a debacle. And in particular, it's hard to imagine how if you're Canadian and you expect the Amer Americans to be the most sophisticated country in the world on a lot of measures, and in particular in, in, in their military operations, and it's not like they were new to the country. They'd been in there for 20 years. And, you know, it just seemed panic stricken. It seemed amateurish. The fact that it was a new administration, I guess, made some people think, well, maybe it's just this administration is really out of their depth. But most people I know in this country thought that this administration came in highly competent with all these very competent appointees uh, and a very experienced politician in President Biden. And it just looked, ham-fisted. It looked like the kind of thing you'd see from the Trump administration, frankly, not from this, this group. Um, so I think for a lot of Canadians, it was kind of shocking. If you're old enough, though, and I'm maybe just old enough, and I've studied it at least, and vaguely remember April 1975, there are parallels. I mean, <laughs> let's be honest about it. I mean, that was a debacle of a withdrawal as well. Uh, it was not the same, but there was, there's some similarities in it. So it's not the first time the Americans you know, had a ham-fisted withdrawal from a country that they've been on the ground in for a long time. But I think it is. it was a bit of a shock to people here about um, you know, the hastiness of it, whether or not there's al better alternatives in terms of the path out will be debated forever, I guess. Um, and to Janice's point in Canada, I think the war in Canada had largely been forgotten. People were talking about Afghanistan, sadly, I guess. You know, it wasn't on the front page of the newspapers. We weren't there for years. And this, of course, drove it back up the agenda to some degree for some period of time. There's a very large diaspora community in Canada, Afghan diaspora community. At one time, it was the largest in the world outside of Afghanistan. 
um, it's, it's significant. And so, and, and as Janice says, we still had people in there that had worked with us when we were there. You're not in a country for 12 years on the ground in Kandahar and Kabul and other places without developing these on the ground networks. And it, the, you know, the, these people were left vulnerable and there wasn't a lot Canada seemed to be able to do about it. Well, we're and all- I, Let me add one more point, Chris, because it's interesting mm, from please. a Canadian perspective. You know, this is not the first time in our history. We relied on U.S. security forces and U.S. intelligence here. You know, I don't know about Jean, but I was looking at this all summer long, and uh, I was not one bit surprised by what happened. If you know anything about the, for instance, about Afghanistan and the North, where the Northern Alliance in 2001 was critical to the defeat of the Taliban, when you saw those first two Northern cities fall, I thought, this is a matter of days, right? Now, I don't have assets, I don't have intelligence assets, but um, if I had uh, any operational responsibilities, I would have had civilian aircraft on the ground the next day, by the way. So just a kind of wake up call too for smaller allies. And you know, <laughs> the story gets replayed over and over again. How much do smaller allies rely on US intelligence? Um, how much operational, independent operational capacity do you have to uh, to evacuate your own people? Because in many ways, these interpreters and fixers are regarded as our people. They mm -hmm. helped our people and we abandoned them. So that raises, I think, some longer term issues would happen um, that transcend the particular moment. And, and I want to pick up on that as we as we come to time. Um, and I'll just mention because although we're all old enough, some of the viewers of this may not be that 1975, you're, Gene, you're referring to the pullout from Vietnam, a war in which Canada avoided direct on the ground involvement. Yeah. Uh, so an interesting parallel. But now we are where we are uh, here in early 22, 20, 2022. What's do you think the legacy of the experience of Canada working with the United States and Afghanistan is in terms of what probably one day will be another conflict, uh, a conflict in which the U.S. asks Canada to uh, to get involved. Um, we don't know the terms, so we're only guessing. But do you think Afghanistan makes Canadians soberer, uh, less confident in American leadership, or or just the same? What do what do Canadians do the next time they get a call from Washington asking them to get involved? Janet. You know, let me make two comments, Chris. I think there's no doubt it makes Canadians more sober. Um, and it's more on almost every level. When you look at the military recommendations from the U.S. military over 20 years, wrong. <laughs> Let's just call it what it is, wrong, overly optimistic, not grounded in knowledge, um, you know, not grounded in a larger political environment. When push came to shove, uh, we couldn't get our people into Kabul airport, right? Um, and, our, and we couldn't get our people out uh, in any meaningful time. That's sobering uh, after a 12-year commitment. But bigger picture beyond that, um, there are as many instances as we stayed out as we went in. And I think Canadians would look back on two big ones, Vietnam and Iraq, where history tells us it was a good decision to stay out. The world is changing um, beyond, and we are in a period where sending expeditionary forces to remake somebody else's politics. I think that moment, uh, that is not the world we're moving into in which we see the return of great power politics. I never thought they went away, but they're so visibly back now. And so those kinds of actions, I think, will be much fewer. And I think there will be more resistance to them when they come. You notice, by the way, in what we are living through right now uh, on the border of Russia and Ukraine, the United States president took off the table expeditionary forces. Absolutely. Gene, how, how, how do you think Canadians will evaluate American leadership uh, and future conflicts with the memory of the whole experience in Afghanistan that Canada had? Well, I think that um, those of 
us that might have been involved in advising the government back then and and those that do that in the future will take uh, a lesson from this, which is, I, I think, what should be, is don't assume, as we often do, the U.S. has a game plan and an end game, and don't assume they will keep their eye on the ball. In Canada, we tend to look at the United States, as I said earlier, as the most sophisticated country on the face of the earth, which it is in many ways. And we tend to be envious of that sometimes to our detriment. Uh, oftentimes, though, the United States doesn't know what they need to know. And, and they don't have a realistic end game. And they never really did in Afghanistan. And, and I think back to meetings I was in 20 years ago when we kind of knew that. We were being told that, sort of that they really don't have a game plan here for Afghanistan, but we sort of ignored it. We kind of thought, I think some of us kind of thought, yeah, they, they must, they must know more than we know. In the end, I'm not sure they did know that much more than, than we knew. And we knew as Janet, Janet said at the beginning, we knew very little about that country. Um, and uh, so I think that's the lesson for Canada. We have to have faith in our ally. Uh, and, it, and it doesn't mean we can't, be with them in conflicts in the future if there are conflicts that 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 the United States gets into but we do have to be skeptical I guess is what I'm saying we have to have a healthy skepticism of our ally its motivations and its commitment and its understanding of these countries that we might follow them into and build up better assets of our own gene have a better intelligence Absolutely. capability so we're not just that's consumers dependent. of what yeah, the United States give us for sure yeah Janice Stein, Gene Lang, thank you so much for joining us here at the Wilson Center. No, Chris, if I can interrupt for just one time, one last thought is where, as we're talking, you know, Gene said we had at the time the largest Afghan diaspora in the world. Think about the capacity that our government had to mobilize people um, for a much more sophisticated interpretation of what Afghan society was like, about what Afghan divisions were like, about you know, what Afghan politics had looked like, right? We could have been better than the United States because we had that diaspora, but we didn't do that. That's on us. Yeah, fair enough. Well, thank you both. The, already I can see that Canada is, is taking some lessons of this conflict, and I think they're lessons that our American audience should take, on, take to heart as well. Uh, the Canada-US relationship remains, I think, a strong one, but uh, sometimes I think it's less of a two-way street than it could be. And there'd be some value in Ameri to American leadership of listening to, to Canadian questioning, not out of disloyalty, but perhaps reminding us of things that we're not, uh, we're not seeing or that we're distracted from seeing in our own intelligence. So uh, thank you both, Janice Stein, Gene Lang for sharing hindsight up front, some lessons that may carry us into the next conflict. My name is Christopher Sands, and this is uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center virtually. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for having us.